Um, just a pleasure to be in the house of the Lord and exalt Him. I'm reminded of what the Bible says over in the book of Hebrews chapter number 10. Uh, the Bible said in verse 24 and 25, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Thank you for considering me tonight. I mean that. Thank you for considering me. Uh, the Bible said, let us consider one another to do what? To provoke unto love and to good works. And then in verse number 25, a way that we can provoke one another to good works according to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. I've been in the ministry a long time and, and um, since 1981, I don't know how long that is, 40 years? Am I right? Is that right? 40 years. 40 years and everywhere I go there's always one that you try to win to the Lord I mean you try to win I say win you, you try to talk to them about the Lord and tell them their need of being in the house of God it may have been with you brother Archer the same way but they they would visit maybe a time or two and they would end up at their own house with uh, their own children their wife they wouldn't they couldn't fit in a church anywhere and uh, they, they don't know what it means to. In other words, everybody's wrong and they're right. Everybody's wrong and they're right. Uh, my dear friend, the Bible says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves. This is how you provoke one another. So find a good Bible-believing church and get in it and use and, and be counted and work for the Lord. Work for the Lord. Uh, the night's coming where no man can work. All right, second sermon. Uh, pretty quick, wasn't it? Y'all like those kind, huh? Second, second sermon, and I got a third one. Second sermon. Wednesday night. You know, I'm, I want to put a Wednesday night. I used a text, and I want you to turn that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to splain myself. Y'all know what splain means, don't you? I'm going to explain myself. I'm going to explain myself. Southern vernacular, I'm going to explain it. I'm fixing to explain it. <laughs> uh, John chapter 1. John chapter 1. I said this Wednesday night, and I'm going back to Titus Wednesday night, by the way. You say you could wait till Wednesday. No, I want to do it tonight. John chapter 1, verse number 9. Jesus is that true light. That's, who, that's what the Bible, there was a man sent from God and he came to bear witness of the light. He wasn't the light, he came to bear witness for the light. The light, Jesus Christ, right? We're in the right context. Verse 9, Jesus, that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Now that's not out of context. He lighteth every man, every man, every man that comes into the world. Lighteth every man. So that really puts a hole in Calvinism, predestination, doesn't it? He lights every man that comes into the world. And um, then I used Romans chapter 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse number 5, where it says that in Romans chapter number 1, they, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter number 13, verse number 5, examine yourselves, and it goes on to say at the end of that verse, lest you be reprobates. Reprobates. I define reprobate as a darkened mind. I still define it as a darkened mind. Uh, but after saying that he's lighted every man that comes into the world, and then saying that people have a darkened mind, where's the light? Where's the light? Well, this is what I'm going to explain. I, I hope uh, that you get a hold of this. Um, it's just like uh, in Ephesians, um, you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. I've heard Calvinists say, when you're dead, you're dead, you can't respond to nothing. Well, I've heard Calvinists say that's not true. That's not a true statement. That's not a true statement. The verse is true. You were dead spiritually. You died spiritually. Adam died spiritually in the garden. He didn't die physically. And there was a tree there in the garden that the angel kept away for him to come to that tree of life 
and the way it's still here. Take your Bibles, go to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Second sermon is coming to a close. Romans chapter 1. The Bible says in uh, verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold, not, hold the truth in unrighteousness. And the reason being, uh, verse 18, because the reason is, verse 19 says, Because that which may be known of God is manifest where? In them God has lit the candle, the candle of the Spirit of God. That, that image that God created us in, body, soul, and spirit, that image was not uh, eradicated, it was marred. So when I use the word reprobates there in um, verse 28, even they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to their way of thinking. And the reason I use the word darken is because Matthew 13 says they have ears that don't hear and eyes that don't see. And so they have a, they're spiritually blinded, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, uh, blinded, lest the light of the glorious gospel, the, the God of this world, little g, God of this world, blinds their minds, uh, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So when I talk about darkened mind, that word darken in, um, in Romans chapter, I mean that word uh, reprobate in Romans chapter 1, and also second, every time it's used in the New Testament, that word reprobate means unapproved, that means rejected or worthless, or worthless. A, 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 when we use darkened minds, we're talking about the blinded mind, their, their interest is on the things of the world. Now, instead of focusing on God, but they, have, they can focus on God. They can. Uh, is, that, is that this time I... top cord right here. It's, it's got a short in it. Yeah, uh, we've got another one. We ordered two or three at a time. I won't walk around with it all. All right, but back in Romans chapter number one, uh, verse number 19, that uh, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. Now look at verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they, who's they? The world, every man. E every man. What may be known of God is manifest in them. Uh, he's manifested, and, and the Bible said, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. They kept turning away from the light that God has given them. And uh, that's when we have, and there's a whole other sermon, I could preach five tonight, but a whole other sermon is be careful if the light be in you be darkness. Yeah. You think it's light, but it's darkness. And uh, so we understand by the heavens, the moon, the stars, the sun, creation, we understand there's a God. The invisible things of God, they show there's a God. All right, that sparked your attention, hopefully. It sparked your uh, your um, interest. So you begin to pursue. Well, we keep reading in the Bible, and the Bible says here in, uh, sec in uh, Romans chapter 2, in verse number 14, for when the Gentiles, that's you and I, that's you and I, if you're not, well, unless, unless you're Jewish, unless you have a Jewish heritage, Hebrew blood in you, you're a Gentile. You're a, Gen you're a Jew or a Gentile. We're not talking about red, yellow, black, and white. We're talking about Jew and Gentiles. For when the Gentiles, who was the law given to? The Jews. The Jews. And where was it given? Sinai. Mount, Mount Sinai. And God used Moses to get the, it was specifically given to the Jews. Now, I've got some people that swell up and say, it's for us too. We learn from it, don't we? We learn how big of a sinner we are if we read it. All right, but now look at the, read, listen to what the scripture has to say. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature, by nature, the things contained in the law. But if you're a Calvinist, they cannot do by nature the things contained in the law because they're already predestined to go to hell. 
What, what a farce. What a joke. Amen. Uh, for when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their hearts or minds, their conscience also bearing witness in their thoughts, so meanwhile is ex accusing or else excusing one another. Before you ever had the law, before you ever had the law, before you knew what the law was, before you knew what scripture was, you knew it was wrong to lie. Your mother never, your, your mother, daddy, I hope your mother, daddy never sit you down at the kitchen table and gave you a crash course on lying. But when you lied, what'd that little heart do? You remember? Boom, 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 boom. So what, what's happening here? The conscience is working on you. We do by nature the things contained in the law. There has to be a God. There has to be a God. There has to be a God by creation. There has to be a God by conscience. Now, we don't do, the conscience is not our standard, by the way. The Bible's your standard. A good conscience will apply the standards. We don't, we don't go by our conscience to live because our conscience can get corrupt. It can even become seared. And then chapter three of Romans, we have the oracles of God in verse number one and two. So we have creation, we have a conscience, and we have the very word of God. So I hope if there's any, any, uh, any confusion over God has lighted every man that you'll see that he has just by that little short brief sermonette there, okay? okay? He has lighted every man that comes into the world and what may be known of God is manifest in them. When you begin to act upon that light, you know what God said he would do in Matthew 21? Give you more light. He said it in Matthew 13. Uh, if you read the parable of the sower, right before you get into the parable of the sower, he talks about the light and the blindness of the eyes and the deafness of the ears. If you will, if you will focus on truth, God has promised you that he would give you more truth. And so we'll have that, finally we come to that understanding of the knowledge of the truth. All right, now take your Bibles and go to Romans 12, sermon number three. And I'll let you go home on time. Uh, Romans chapter 12. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, we know that we've preached on salvation pretty much all day, and we know that man could not do anything for himself concerning salvation. So what he did is God stepped in, did everything that was needed to be done for man. All that man can do is believe God's word. And Romans chapter 4 said that's not a work. Yeah, believing. Him that believeth, worketh not, but believeth. So God, God says that's not a work in believing. Um, I had my desk pile full of stuff the other day. Well, it's always pile full of stuff. And... Uh, not as bad as Brother Donnell's, but it's powerful of stuff. And uh, anyway, powerful of stuff. And I told that individual, I said, just look at my desk. All these are works. All these are, are God's works. God's works for my salvation. All this mess here, not, his wasn't a mess, but mine was. All of this stuff here was God's works for my salvation. He worked, he satisfied God, he paid the price, he lived a sinless life. He did everything right, holy, and necessary. But I look at all of these works and I've got, I said, uh-oh, God, you're forgetting one thing. So I take one of my works and I throw it on my desk. I said, now I can go to heaven. Is that true? God has done everything necessary. Um, the moment you think that you put one little finger in there to help God get you to heaven, it's, a, it's works by, it's a salvation by works. It's not by grace but through faith any longer. So all of his good works. And uh, I hope that got through to that individual, but it's Christ did it all. All that man can do is believe God's word. And then the great act of redemption, the great act of redemption is immediately transferred out of the... Uh, what, what out of the uh, theoret th theoretical into 
the living practical life of Christ within the heart of the believer. In other words, God takes his abode up his abode in you. Um, so everything necessary was done by the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're talking about uh, mercy, looking at, uh, let me get my thoughts straight. Romans chapter number 12, verse number one, we're talking about mercy. The mercy that God had on this world in the person of Christ when he judged Christ for our sins was very merciful. You remember in uh, Luke chapter number 18 where the publican smote upon his breast and said, God be what? Merciful unto me a sinner. If you will study that, he's, he's asking God to look at him as he looked at the blood-stained mercy seat. It's a propitiation, propitiation, a satisfactory sacrifice. Look at me as you look at the atoning blood. So God, in that sense, had mercy on the entire world. He had mercy on the entire world. God can act toward us in grace because he has already had mercy upon us. Amen? And the fountain is now open and flowing and it flows freely. And so we can look back to Calvary and sing, mercy there was great and grace was free. And that's uh, mercy, the mercy of God. All right, now we're looking at the mercy of God, the totality of God's mercy in Christ. And then we look at the mercy in Romans chapter three. In Romans chapter 12, it said mercy's plural. Mercy's plural. So we looked at the totality of God's mercy Mercy and salvation, mercy and redemption. But then we can get to uh, Romans chapter number three. If you'll take your Bibles, go back to Romans chapter number three and we look at the mercy of God that was planned by God. In the fullness of time, according to Galatians, uh, God sent forth his son made of a woman. And the Bible says to redeem us that we're under the law. And so he redeemed us, he bought us. But uh, in Romans chapter number three, in the fullness of time, God's mercy flowed out in Christ's death for us. Look at verse number 25. The Bible said, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which, which what? Believeth on, in Jesus. Believeth in Jesus. God is just in justifying you because you believed on his son. Amen. So we look at the mercy that was planned by God there in Romans chapter number three. When a man was fully shown to be guilty in Romans chapter one, two, and three, then God shows up in verse 21. Man is totally shown up and especially in verse 20, this should quench anyone that thinks they can work their way to heaven. The Bible said, therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law is good, the law is right, the law is holy. The law shows you you're an exceeding, very exceeding sinner, sinful sinner, is what it shows us. And we need a savior. All right, man's shown up. And then we get in verse number 25, uh, one, the Bible said, but now, but now, thank God for the but nows. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe for there is no difference. I know we have some first time visitors here tonight, but God doesn't mince words. God doesn't mince words when he writes them down. He just don't fill in the blanks so he can turn into paper. I did that in college one time. I did. I was in electrical engineering. And uh, it was AC and DC circuits. And I wrote a paper, did not know, uh, have a clue what I was talking about. One of those times I didn't take my books home and study. And I wrote a paper and I listed everything that a man could list on DC and AC circuits. And I filled in with some of the prettiest words you've ever seen, you've ever heard in your life. Almost sounded like Brother Donnell. I pick on him a lot, yeah. Almost sounded like him. And I turned that paper in, I thought, man, I got this, I got this down. And you know what? I, I fooled that old boy. He gave me my paper back the following week and he wrote in capital letters in, in, in magic marker red, not just ink pen red, and he put fluff, 
F. <laughs> fluff. God doesn't give fluff. God, we don't, God doesn't mince words. In verse number 22, the Bible says, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all. It's unto all. That means when the blood of Jesus Christ was shed, forgiveness was granted, God was propitiated. Am I right? God was, the propitiation propitiated God. The satisfactory sacrifice pleased God. The blood was shed one time for the what? Forgiveness of sins, one time for all, forever, one time. So the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all. It's unto everybody. Again, if you'll just read the Bible, it, it, it will shut those Calvinists up. It will. It's unto all, and then it goes what? Upon all that does what? Wow. Why do we want to add a bunch of fluff to salvation? If it's upon all that believeth. To believeth. Believe what? Christ. Who he is. What he's done. He finished the work of redemption. All of it. Salvation, Jonah said, is of the Lord. Amen. All right, so God showed up. And when God showed up, he sure, he sure shut our mouths, didn't he? Amen. All mouths will be stopped. Now, if you don't understand this, my friend, you'll never understand true salvation. And the important fact is found both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Bible talks about it in Isaiah chapter 53, verse number 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief when he, thou shalt uh, make his soul an offering for sin. That's exactly what God did. Amen. Um, and God said over in Exodus 34, verse number 7, that God will in no means, by no means, by no means, clear the guilty. Now you think about that. And I'm, I'm not contradicting myself either. The Bible said God will not clear the guilty. Well, we go up and tell people God's going to clear, you know, we, we better be careful how we talk to people. God did not clear the guilty. God judged the guilty. Now you're getting a hold of it, aren't you? God became a man, Jesus Christ, the person of Christ, the Son of God, was made sin for us who knew no sin, and God judged the guilty. And I'm standing over here knowing that it should have been me. Knowing it, knowing that. Knowing that I deserve to go to hell. I deserve the justice of God. I deserve that. That's what I deserved. To go to hell, be cast in the lake of fire for forever and ever and ever. I, I deserve that. But instead, God put all my sins on Christ and God, God did not clear. God received his payment for the guilty. Pretty simple if you think about it. All right, the mercies of God. That's the mercies of God in Romans 1, Romans 2, Romans 3. Now, we're talking mercies plural. The mercies of God have been provided by God without any work on the part of man. Uh, Romans chapter 4 and 5. Romans 4 and 5. You're getting a crash course on Romans. The mercies of God have been provided by God without any work on the part of man. And this particular truth is taught in the life of Abraham. God, in, in Romans chapter 4, God made certain promises to Abraham. Abraham believed them, a promised seed. They were promises that involved a belief that God was able to bring forth life out of death. How do I know that to be true? Because I've read verse 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 of Romans 4. Look at that. Who against hope believed in hope. Verse 18. That he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in the faith, he considered not his own body. Now what? Dead. When he was about a hundred years old. Neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Now, if I came up and said, my, and I, my wife's probably watching, so I better behave. 
on uh, YouTube. If I come up and say, me and my wife's expecting a baby in nine months, well, you'd say, God love his heart. <laughs> you'd, that, that Southern dick said, bless his heart. <laughs> you know that it couldn't be true. There's no way possible, shape, form, or fashion. So when I'm talking about the story of Abraham, the deadness of, of himself and the deadness of Sarah's womb, but the Bible said in verse 20, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Abraham knew that. Abraham knew he, when he killed his own son that God was going to bring him back to life. How do I know that? Uh, Hebrews 11. He was able to bring him forth again. Why? Because Abraham believed that through his seed, a promised Messiah would come. How do I know that? I'm, I'm asking you to prove me. Galatians, say Galatians 3. I knew you knew that. Galatians chapter 3, that seed is Christ. That's how that every nation, every family could be blessed by Abraham. Be, because, and then all nations would be blessed. Why? Because his seed would come and that seed, Galatians says, is Christ. And so through Christ, I am spiritually a member of Abraham's family. And if you're saved, you're a son or a daughter of Abraham. Amen? That's what I told those Mormons that came to my door. We were doing a genealogy. I said, man, I can go way back. I can go all the way back to Abraham. Blew their minds. And we can go all the way back to Abraham. We're a son or daughter of Abraham. And it's by faith. By faith. That's how I get in the family. I don't, have, I don't have any physical resemblance of a Jew. I don't, have, I don't have the blood of a Jew. I don't have the covenant promises of a Jew. But I'll tell you what I do have. I've got Jesus Christ. And I'm going to be there with him. I'm a, spiritually a part of the family of Abraham. All right. Uh, mercies of God have been provided by God without any work on the part of man. Um... The next of the mercies of God is where God tells that he has joined every believer to Christ and that everything that is Christ, Christ's, becomes ours in him. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. When Christ died under the wrath of God, everyone who trusts Christ as Savior is also seen by God to have died under that wrath. When Jesus was raised from the dead, God counted every believer in him to have been raised from the dead also. Everything that God thinks about his dear son, his beloved son, he also thinks about the believers in Christ. Look at Romans chapter 6 verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Now, I hadn't got a thing about. There's no, there's no water in verse 3. No water. That's a holy... I was baptized into Christ. That's a, whole, that's a spirit of God baptism. That's a 1 Corinthians 12 baptism. All right? That's the one faith, one Lord, one baptism in Ephesians 4. All right, now the Bible said in verse 4, Therefore we are buried with him by, by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. That's why we baptize with water. That's one of our ordinances that the Bible gives us. When I say ours, I'm talking about the church. The Lord's Supper and baptism. Baptism is not... Bab Listen, Milton City water cannot wash away one sin. If you think it can, you missed it. If that's what you're depending on to get you to heaven, you're going to miss it. Baptism is a picture of the death. We go under the water, the death, the burial. And when you come out of the water, you're identifying yourself with the death, burial, and the resurrection. We're raised to walk in newness of life in Christ Jesus. Revelation 1.5. Amen. Um, but anyway, in Romans chapter number 6, let me keep reading here in verse, uh, verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead...
dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him, for in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. We don't, we don't go back and say, Lord, will you die for me again? When you trust Christ and the Spirit of God enters you, that's new life in Christ. And we have that new life in Christ. And now we have the instructions to keep under our body and bring it into subjection. So we have all these mercies in Romans chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And then you go to Romans chapter 8, you have mercy of no condemnation. I'm saved one time. One time, really saved one time. Now, I've made professions of faith more than one time. But we're saved one time. One time. In Romans chapter number 8, you cite the mercies of, of, of uh, no condemnation. The Bible said in verse uh, 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Well, a person could take that verse and lift it out and say, Uh-huh, you got to walk in order to keep it. Well, what does the Bible say in, um, in verse uh, 9? But we are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. So how does a man walk after the Spirit? That's it. <laughs> That's the only way. It's, it's the only way. So Romans chapter number 8 is no condemnation mercies. Thank God for that, huh? See, it is, it is totally impossible for God to bring any condemnation to a believer. And the reason being is because of Romans chapter number 8, verse number 3. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh... God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. It's impossible for God to bring condemnation to a believer. Amen. Can't do it. Amen. All his condemnation was poured out on the Lord Jesus Christ. He condemned sin in the flesh when he judged Christ. That's what he did. All right, so we, we have that, and then we have Romans chapter 8. I wish I had time just to go through it. It's, but what shall we say then? These things of God be for us. Who can be against us? Verse 31. So we have that mercy. And then we get all the way back to Romans chapter number 12. And verse number 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. We've looked at these mercies, Romans chapter 1 all the way up to Romans 12 glanced at them a little bit, talked about a few of them at length. But we, we, that's why when we get to Romans chapter number 12, that we present ourselves to him. A living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. What you're listening to real quick in Romans chapter number 12 and verse number one is a practical appeal. After, after, after doctrine, and we've looked at, I mean, you, you and I both know, any preacher here knows that we could expound it on these chapters at length. It would have taken a year on just on, from Romans chapter 1 to Romans 12. But after doctrine comes duty. After doctrine comes duty. After revelation comes responsibility. After principles come practice. Paul says in Romans chapter number 12, verse number 1, I beseech you. Now, this is true. This is, this is, this is true. For all, for all Christian teachers is we should be beseeching, pleading, exhorting. People ask me what that word exhorting means. It, it means to admonish or encourage through persuasive truth. But let me tell you something. You can stand up here all you want and tell people you have truth. But you better be able... To give me a scripture and a verse. You better back it up in the context. You better back it up with what you have to say. See, that's substance. I was 
telling a precious soul today that our substance, uh, the Bible said faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is not stepping out in, in oblivion. Faith is stepping out on substance. When we took Samantha down the stairs, we made sure there was a stair there she could step on. Substance. When, when, we, when we step out by faith, we step out on thus saith the Lord. God said, go into all the world and preach the gospel so I can go. I'm not stepping out by faith, wondering if God's going to take care of my needs. I'm stepping out on substance. Amen. So that's, that's what we have here. That's I beseech you. I beseech you. I exhort you. Um, so here's the mercies right here that God will carry us through. If you'll notice in Romans chapter number 12, verse 2, be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Mercies of God are new every day. Uh, I don't want to be conformed to this world. I, I want God to renew my mind so I know what I need to do. I know what I'm, I'm required to do for though, that particular mercy for God to enlighten my mind so I can help others is I'm going to have to do what? Study. Thank you. I'm going to have to read the Bible and I'm going to have to study. I'm going to have to read the Bible and I'm going to have to study. And if you ever expect to help anyone, you can give your opinions all day long and it'll measure up to about like that. But if you'll give his opinion, they'll have substance to stand on. Amen? Let's stand on our feet. Let's stand on substance.